Hello, party people. I think we are live on YouTube. I'll just take a moment here to see if the delay kicks in. Yep, there we are. <laughs> all good. Welcome, everybody. I see we have uh, quite a few people here today. How are we all doing? Everybody yeah. signed off in the comments. I have with me here Catherine. Daniel could not join us today, but uh, you know, as we all know, the topic today is exploring story structure. Um, I have to give you a, a little bit of forewarning too. That one of the things we're going to do, if you have, if you are a member <laughs> or you've been uh, watching the schedule on the YouTube channel, you'll know that next week what we're going to do is mm -hmm. jump into the depths of dissecting some stories using, you know, comparing to the structure. But um, what I also want to do today, I, of course, do have a story in mind that I can use to illustrate. Uh, I've asked Catherine. We'll see if she's got one in mind as well. Um, <laughs> and all of you watching, I think a great thing to get involved as we go through it today is, um, as we point out each of, the, each of the beats or each of the parts of your, your standard structure, um, mm -hmm. think if you have a story in mind, whether it's a movie or a book, uh, or a graphic novel, so just some kind of story that you enjoy, and see if you can identify which parts in that story are likely to be these individual specific beats. Uh, we'll see if uh, if that sounds fun. I'm excited to see what everybody's got. And we'll let everybody fall into their seats here. Where have we got? Loads and loads of places around the world. <laughs> Ohio, Wisconsin, the UK. Ah, uh, we do have Christopher representing the UK. <laughs> can you hear me, Gareth? I can do. You're back now. Okay, perfect. A beautiful day, Dory. Nice. It's actually getting uh, quite sunny around here again in the UK. We I think we're due another heat wave this week, so it has been it has been getting quite warm again. Hi from sunny Florida, Andrea. Okay, very nice indeed. Well, we will jump in here. As you can see on my screen, I do have some slides, so I can uh, adjust the uh, screen here, become bigger, take up more of the frame. Um, and what we'll do is walk through and just talk about each of these parts of your standard story structure. Now, uh, a couple of things to sort of clear out of the way there as well is that these points, um, if you are familiar with something you might have heard called the seven point story structure um, that most people do tend to use is just like this. <laughs> um, and I can't remember if in this breakdown that we'll be using, we have seven because you'll, you'll have a lot of people use different approaches to, to the, the beats of a story. Um, mm -hmm. When we're saying beats, it's just like the important parts, the standout elements are our real story beats. We'll get into a couple of those as we go. Um, however, they all wrap up, even though there's like seven points, they will wrap up into a three act structure. So they're taking place at certain points in, in each of the different acts. And uh, why I think it's actually fun or interesting to uh, try to point out some parts that you'll see in this during, you know, from stories that you know or things that you enjoy is that you'll often have two people when you're kind of brainstorming it back and forth, disagree about which particular event or which beat in the story at a certain point actually constitutes what you would expect from the seven points <laughs> or, or different elements of the of the structure. So it's not entirely solid. And that's one of the great things that I think it really pays to understand is that number one, you wrap your head around the standard story structure, really understand it, get it ingrained in you, but also understand that it's not such a rigid box. There are mm -hmm. things you can do at different points that, uh, again, would have maybe somebody thinking, okay, this was the, we'll give a little bit of a spoiler here, but you know, this was the inciting incident or this was the inciting incident because a couple of things happened so close to each other. Um, and one of the examples that I will use today, um, I think some people also may have different views on what something like the inciting incident was so i guess with that said uh, let's get into it does everybody uh, you know give us give us some confirmation in the in the chat there in the comments have you got a story in mind maybe a, a movie might be easy or a book and what is it <laughs> tell us 
you don't have to feel on the spot to do your own today because plotting beats can be tough. So if you'd rather use one that's like well established and you can go, oh, yeah, I relate to that, then that's fine. And you can go back and apply it to your book. Yeah, so I think a favorite behind the scenes here, every time we're talking about something in a, a structural sense, seems to always be the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars, yeah. Funnily enough, Darth Victive <laughs> says Star Wars. <laughs> Everyone knows it. Yeah, Star Wars as well. I think Daniel likes to use Star Wars. Yes, you all hear Star Wars complaints from me. Well, you know, it's a classic. Oh, Labyrinth with David Bowie. Yes, Psyche. Oh, Harry Potter. Yes. Don't judge my thematic consistency. <laughs> Even if I judge it positively? Got some great ideas. The Martin. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, The Martian. Okay. Well, that's... Uh... Let's jump in and see what you come up with. So everybody, if you are following along, you know, you can do it by yourself or feel free to pop it in the chat sort of what event you think is uh, is is uh, happening there in the story. Um, I guess, uh, no, Harry, it doesn't, does not have to be a film. Uh, films are often easier uh, just to, to, to recall immediately. But if you do have a, a book in your mind, absolutely. Um, we probably should put a bit of a caveat here that, of course, we're talking with a nice number of people here and we're going to be talking about the intricacies of stories and what happens in them so there may be spoilers here <laughs> for things that you probably haven't seen but of course uh, i guess we can just say if you are talking about it in the chat um don't talk about anything brand new you know we don't want to spoil things for people but classics everybody knows star wars um for example and uh yeah harry mary shelley's frankenstein just about everybody knows what happens in frankenstein um I'm going to mention uh, Ridley Scott's Alien because uh, I think it's fabulous. Nice and very classic Gareth. So let me get the uh, next slide up here. When we're talking story structure, we're going to go start to finish as we explore. Now, obviously, every story has two things. It ends and it also begins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we're talking about the beginning of a story, this is essentially your opening. Uh, the beginning has a, a couple of things that you're doing with it. Uh, number one is introducing us to the characters themselves. So we're getting to know who these people are initially. But also, very importantly, in that beginning is understanding their world, the, the mm -hmm. way things are at the beginning. Uh, you know What you could refer to as the status quo is right. this is normal life for this person. And uh, But that doesn't mean that it has to be mundane. In fact, it shouldn't be mundane. Uh, as we come into uh, you know life... Uh, everyday life i don't think very many of us probably have it super simple every single day that uh, nothing ever happens and there's never any challenges and because it's the status quo that nothing ever goes wrong uh quite the opposite so even mm. though we're being introduced to the way life is for our characters initially we do want them to still be dealing with something um mm. it's often really really good momentum to kick the story off with if they are in the middle of dealing with something there is a problem that they're they're overcoming at that point. Now, it, it may not be related to the entire main plot that's going to be coming up in the story, but they're at least dealing with something. Um, any thoughts on that one, Catherine? Oh, I completely agree. You know, just the beginning shouldn't, I know it's very popular, especially in like action thriller, throw you into the story and you have no concept for anything. Even if that's how you start, there should be some semblance of what life was in that early portion of the book. Um, like if you start out in an action scene, make sure you come back and <laughs> let us know because otherwise it's hard to relate to these characters, right? We all want to connect and relate to them and almost find something about them or their life that we could say, what if this was us? And then that carries us with a deeper investment to the story through the book. Yeah, exactly right. And it's it's one of these things that I like to track uh, when dealing with any point of a story, if I'm kind of structuring something uh, to put together, is marking down as well where the conflicts are all the time. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much every single section needs some kind of conflict. Uh, and I think a lot of people can walk into that trap in the you know that the very beginning they're like oh i'm setting the groundwork here i'm just describing who this person is and getting in there but there's nothing interesting happening mm -hmm. uh, usually because there's no conflict because there's a, a mistaken belief that this is the beginning i can just be plain 
Uh, but no, nobody wants that. Yes, exactly. And the, uh, I guess that opening too, when you're introducing that conflict, um, I kind of mentioned it before, but you want a, a, a momentum coming into the story. And this is one of the things where it's, uh, you'll hear people mention it a lot, is that starting in medias res, you start in the middle uh, of something. So you're really, two things that are happening there. It, you can be starting in the middle of a conflict uh, like I said earlier, where they're actually actively involved in dealing with something. There's a problem that they're fixing. That problem right at the beginning does not necessarily have to be related to the main plot. I think some people get caught up in that. They're like, oh, I need to I need to kick things off immediately and get right into the... You don't necessarily need to, no. Um, you're just setting, again, the, 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 the groundwork for the current status quo, what life is like for now. Because uh, I think we all know, um, if you don't know, well, this is a really great way to to think of it too, is that over the course of a story, the main character's life is going to change. Things are going to change. Uh, that can either be physically, you know, their entire world, uh, or it can be just their mindset, but the way they view the world, these things are going to change. So what we want to do initially is set that groundwork. Like this is how things are now. And then we can actually see at the end of the story, how things have changed. So we've been through an arc, as, uh, as I like to refer to it as. And uh, yeah, we can see Dick uh, in the comments there. Nope, it's not a hard and fast rule. Yep, not at all. Uh, that was in response to Matthew was asking, is it a rule that the first chapter needs to introduce the main protagonist? Uh, it seems logical. I'm just curious if that is a hard and a fast rule. Um, Dick is quite right there, Matthew. No, it is not a uh, hard and fast rule. Um, it's generally seen as good form i suppose mm -hmm. um but it is not a hard and fast rule um one of the things that you could do for example uh, especially in the horror genre uh is start off the story with a shock so your first chapter could be uh, well let me put it this way whenever you start a chapter from a character's point of view or you introduce that character first we subconsciously assume that that character is the main character or is at least the point of view character for that chapter. So right. since they're the first person we saw, we attach to them. Um, right. what, what you don't want to do is introduce a character first and then switch to somebody else and all of a sudden, because that becomes a little confusing. However, if it's the first chapter in your book, let's say you introduce a character, we're learning about them, we're in their point of view, we're deep in there, we're getting to know them and everything's, you know, we're seeing their life and getting an idea of the things that they're maybe dealing with in the first half of this chapter. And then the villain shows up and murders them. Now, there's a shocker of a beginning because we initially thought as we started into there that this was going to be our main character and we're starting to get to know them and all of this. But then it, it's a real punch then that, OK, this chapter was actually more about the villain and bringing them onto the scene than your actual main character. So we can move into the main character on chapter two. Something like that can work. It's not a hard and fast rule at all. Yeah, it's very story dependent and it's going to determine, it's going to be determined by your genre too. You know, if you're pitching a cozy romance, then your audience may not like you having somebody who's not ever going to come up again later in the story. And then, of course, to Gareth's point, them get killed off because it's not going to work in that genre. Um, so you have to know your audience and know your genre. Yes, definitely know the audience and the genre. Um, a lot of these things, yeah, that are that are kind of quote unquote rules or, or can be changed or messed with, uh, can be changed or messed with to different levels of capacity depending on what the audience of a certain genre expects. Yep. But that's also why I guess, uh, and I do believe that knowing this standard structure inside and out um, really helps universally anyway, be anywhere, because once you figure this out and you know that uh, again, inside and out, you're like, okay, yeah, I can pop out a story more or less straight from initial idea to something that resembles a, a solid structure. Um, you'll know where you can apply it and what you can mess with. It's kind of mm -hmm. knowing the rules before you break them. Is the, is the best approach. Uh, coming in with something completely broken without knowing the rules is just a broken product. Right. So there's our little thing there, the introduction. And that's uh, the introduction to our characters, to their world, to the status quo. But the, uh, the point to sign off on that with is remember conflict. Uh, you want them starting in the middle of something. There's already stuff going on. And that doesn't right. necessarily have to be related to the main plot. And everybody's favorite part, this is the inciting incident. <laughs> Comes up next after the uh, thing. So this is where you are 
clashing <laughs> usually your uh, your antagonist and your protagonist you know their worlds collide something happens uh, you'll see this often referred to as well uh, and i think it might be our next little image here to illustrate that as the call to adventure so they're uh, invited off to go do these things um, now a little tip that I like to uh, include in this, uh, since it is, you know, the, the the big main event that propels them into the plot, um, they're going to have to make a choice here. Mm -hmm. And one of the core choices that really any storyteller gets faced with, well, there's kind of two two questions or two choices wrapped up in that, is why this person, uh, why is this event, how, why is this story only about this person? this protagonist because uh, often if you sit down and think about it with something you're planning or maybe you have written some stuff if i just replace this character with somebody else and everything else would play out exactly the same way well mm -hmm. then why is this of why is this their story why is it a story um what are you trying to do there there's room to make it more interesting and tie it more closely to your protagonist so they're the only person really that can that can do this right. and um the second question that goes into that again at the at the point of the inciting incident this leads on to the next point, really, is why don't they just say no? <laughs> so they have, the, the, the call to adventure has happened. They are invited to take on this journey and uh, go prove themselves and set right what has been wrong uh, by way of the, the antagonist. And what if they just say, no, I don't want to do that. Um, I'm not going to do that. Now, of course, your story can't happen. Um, so there has to be ways for them to be kind of forced in, into being a part of it all. Uh, right. I'll mention that slightly just next. But one way that I like to make this, uh, this is just a little tip from, from my perspective that I really like to use to make it more engaging once you have the call to adventure and the, we're beginning to propel uh, into the world of the story is that your main character at that time is faced with a dilemma. They, they've got two options, option A or option B uh, of what they can do about this. Neither of those options are satisfactory. Um, mm -hmm. they both come with a trade-off uh, or a, a negative side that can either be physical consequences or real consequences in the world, but it can also be personal betrayal. You know, if it betrays their morals, if it betrays what their, their principles, what they believe about themselves, they don't want to choose that. But also if by sticking to their morals and their principles, everybody that they've ever known will drop dead, then what do they do? Uh, they, they can't exactly go with either one of those. Um, so they're struggling between the two. And as they go into the story and uh, more is happening, they're kind of bouncing between pillar and post, between, uh, oh, God, I, I can't go with A, I can't go with B, um, until they manage, if you want to make it a fully kind of heroic story, uh, straight line through it all, they eventually discover option C. You know, they figure out a way that, uh, and this is why it's important to go back to that point of why this character, because it's, figuring out an option that it feels like only that person could have figured out. You know, there's something about that character that their skills, their knowledge, uh, who they are inside, the things that they do that, that manage to find this option C that uh, takes them free of it and punishes the wicked and does all the right things to, to tie up the story heroically. Right. Um, and what do you think about inciting incidents? Oh, I was going to call back. We'll bring up some stories here. So uh, anybody in the comments, beginnings now what i want to say is if you are calling out a story um think about more or less one event if we can tie it up because of course a beginning might have five or six different things that, that happen in the beginning but if you can summarize it let's get the beginning and the inciting incident now obviously i would say the beginning alien uh more or less actually opens with both um because the inciting incident is the distress call um that the uh, nostromo receives and the ins uh, the beginning is that distress call arriving, which wakes up the crew from hypersleep. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost combined. Uh, what about you, Catherine? Well, um, I am going to go with The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so the beginning starts very, it seems very mundane, you know, in the hole in the ground, there was a hobbit, but it sets the tone for his everyday life. And then a bunch of dwarves literally fall on his doorstep. Um, and he gets sucked into fighting within himself, like the values you said for the mm. inciting incident. Um, he hears the plight of the dwarves wanting to regain their home and face off against hopefully the dead dragon. Um, and he's never belonged and he wants to belong. 
So he actually has a, no, I'm not going to do this. But then sweeps back to, well, I should do this. And then he wakes up the next morning. No, I'm not going to do this. And then decides ultimately he doesn't want to live a life as a nobody. So he'd at least rather try to help. His call to action is wanting to help the others uh, regain something that he feels he's taken for granted. Mm, so it comes in the form of a, a personal challenge. Right. And what do we have happening in the comments? Anybody find one? Or if he's transported to Oz. Mike says, uh, of course, she doesn't have a choice. No, she nope. sort of gets that. <laughs> Your characters sometimes get choices and sometimes they don't get choices. Like Garrett's example, they got woken up and nothing they could do about it. <laughs> yep, this is one of these things uh, that I will bring up next too, because it's an integral part, I think, of many, many great stories. Now, not every story uses this but it's the refusal of the call. Um, this is ties up hand in hand with the call to adventure. Now, the reason that it is actually uh, so effective and a really great thing to use is that it helps you reinforce why they don't just walk away. Um, and at the same time, reinforce why it's this character who is really driving this story, why it's theirs to, uh, well, essentially theirs to tell or theirs to lead um, mm -hmm. rather than anybody else. Now, refusal of the call, yes, indeed, it can come in many, many forms. Um, the response to the refusal is how you then justify them staying involved, especially if uh, the stakes are really deadly. You know, most people would be like, um, this is the antagonist, this is what you're up against, this is what's going on, and they're after you. And you go, okay, well, I'm getting on a plane to the North Pole, and I'm just going to live there as a hermit and never see anybody ever again, because that's right. less challenging. Now, you then have options to make them stay. Um, mm -hmm. Like Che saying in the uh, comments, how about not a choice? You know, it's not their decision. You're stuck. Uh, something like orders. Orders can be a tough one because um, they will actually... See, orders are interesting because initially orders, um, if you have someone do something bad because of orders and they're supposed to be your protagonist, uh, it can be tough to bring people back in line uh, after yeah. that, even though the story, because uh, doing things based on orders leads to a real, again, a uh, challenge of morals and principles. That's right. often and how these stories are told. Some readers uh, view orders as a choice. Yeah. Uh, un unless they end up as tragic stories, um, often does not work unless they refuse the order. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kicks off the story. Uh, mm -hmm. the re the, what they're facing is the repercussions for, for not fulfilling the order. Um, I've seen some stories, read some stories too, um, that did not really get away with their main character kind of building them up for a bit and then going to a flashback where they, under orders, executed innocent people. Um, and you're just like, I don't really think... You have to do a lot of work to bring them back from that. Um, mm -hmm. And you can it can feel cheated if you just throw that in. It's like, oh, well, it's traumatic for them because they had to do this thing because that they were ordered to do. And I'm like, well, what about the people they killed? You know, surely it was, you know, they mattered more uh, in terms of trauma in that situation. So mm -hmm. it can be very, very difficult. However, the refusal of the call, yeah, is all the ways that uh, you get the opportunity to show why they can't walk away. The stakes are too high. Um, physically trapped is literally one of them. Uh, you can't, you simply cannot leave. And there's um, moral obligations as well. Um, you you cannot run away. If you were to run away, if this character was to run away under the weight of a moral obligation, well, then they seem like a coward. And that's mm -hmm. not going to be a story. <laughs> the story kind of ends there. The coward ran away uh, and let their whole family die. So, okay. I <laughs> uh, guess that's the end of that. Uh, they're not exactly a protagonist. Yeah. I so. mean, the hobby is like that. He tries to run away when he refuses the call and um, in the cave with the goblins. And then the floor caves in and then everybody at the end is like, wait a minute, you were going to leave us? <laughs> <laughs> he isn't allowed to run away by the plot but he tries and then he gets a change of heart so if you're planning on having them attempt to run away and something stops them that could work but to Gareth's point there's not a whole lot of story there if it's okay I'm getting to this point and then never mind nope bye <laughs> yeah because that's that's the initial thing too I mean there's nothing wrong with having an arc uh of something like the hobbit where it is you know it's it's the the cowardly little hobbit tries to run away uh, because that's who they are. They're just like, no, this isn't for me. Uh, I'm not part of this. But it turns out you can't leave. And then they become a warrior, essentially, mm -hmm. is the whole arc. 
yeah. finding finding strength and finding courage. Um, so that that is absolutely fine. However, it would be completely different if he just ran back to the Shire and that was the end of the story. The Hobbit's no exactly. longer there. Um, <laughs> In, in the case of something real, real simple, like uh, Alien, we're following along, the refusal of the call comes almost immediately again after they wake up, they get the thing. Some of the crew members are like, we don't have time to waste on this, we're not doing it, but it's an obligation, um, contractually. Uh, it's just like a maritime uh, mm. sealer, sealing rules. You hear a distress call, you respond. Yep. I love that there's still an argument you know, an alien about, we don't have time for this. Nope, we're going anyway. And more arguments after that as well, because uh, when they are then setting down on the planet to to find it, again, there's conflict always going on between the, uh, the crew members there. Some are like dead against it. We don't know what's out there. We don't know if there's going to be some kind of infection. Uh, and that's something we will also get to when it comes to the uh, transition to Act 2, because uh, what can happen or what generally happens in the transition as we move into Act 2, but some people um, may miss it, is a little climax in itself. Something that happens at the end of Act 1 to punctuate, to actually push your characters over that line. Mm -hmm. So they've gotten to the the gates of adventure, let's just say. They've stood there and went, I don't think I really want to do this, but then something happens, and the result of that is they're pushed through the doorway. Uh, and we're into Act Two. This is the the longer part of the story. So now the adventure really begins as they're going to start heading towards the solution. It's up to me to fix this whole situation, and I'm going to take care of that, or I'm going to do that. Right. Now with Alien, uh, as I said there, when we get to essentially the beginning, is everything wrapped up in there? If you ask a lot of people, um, what is the inciting incident in Alien? They'll tell you Kian getting the face hugger. So that when when they go down to the planet and the face hugger jumps on Kian, that's the inciting incident. It's not mm -hmm. the inciting incident is way at the very beginning. It's the distress yeah. call. Um, the inciting incident, or sorry, the uh, face hugger incident is the climax of Act One. It's the propulsion into Act Two, where they can no longer do anything about it. They're in for the ride. Right. And uh, there's a refusal of the call kind of built into that the whole way through. It's kind of elongated there because you have them arguing about who's going down onto the planet's surface, uh, what to do when they're inside. It's like be careful. Uh, don't poke at things <laughs> and uh, unfortunately they do poke at things and um, even when Kian gets the face hugger on him some of the crew members don't want him on the ship because he could uh, like Ripley as well in particular because he could be carrying a parasite it's like this is something that we don't want on board right. and they uh, bring him on board which is uh, <laughs> yeah so that brings us into act into act two as we get ready for more nasty stuff to happen but uh, any thoughts in terms of whether The Hobbit does that? Do we have a, a kind of further little punctuating beat? Yeah. So you know, I think a lot of people who read The Hobbit, they think the inciting incident is when they're first on the road and they run into the trolls who decide they're going to cook all the dwarves. Um, but as you pointed out with Alien being very at the very beginning, the inciting incident should be what changes status quo. That doesn't mean it has to be the most dramatic thing in that act. Um, so for the Hobbit, his inciting incident is the dwarf showing up on his doorstep, which then sets in motion his values not allowing him to just live normal life anymore. He has to go with them. Um, and then, of course, the trolls sort of serves as a confirmation that, oh, I'm doing the right thing because he saves them and he gets recognition. But then the refusal of the call and sort of the act that propels into act two um, is again in that cave after they've been with the elves and they show up and there's all these troll like giants. They're throwing rocks and there's lightning everywhere. And he's like, this is too dangerous. I can't do this. This is not worth. This has now gone beyond my values. If I don't make it home, what was it worth it? Um, and he tries to leave and then literally the cave floor falls out from under them <laughs> um, and takes them down into the mountain where the only way out is to go forward. Um, so it literally seizes him and throws him into the second act that way. Okie dokie. I'm just going to catch up with uh, some comments here as well. Oh, the Martian. 
opening, visiting Mars, inciting incident, the storm. Yep, changes things that uh, throws quite a big spanner in the <laughs> in the works of the status quo. And uh, an accident lift off, yep, stranding the astronaut. Mm -hmm. And potatoes. I'm curious on my Star Wars people because there's so many different Star Wars now, unless you're talking about Star Wars the book, which I've also read and I like, um, which Star Wars they picked and what the inciting incident and call to action was. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that could be quite a that could be quite a discussion. Yeah, based on the movie because they all will follow pretty much the same kind of structure. But uh, by the time you get to like the third volume of something, um, you're more or less riding on the the fallout or the coattails of previous inciting incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's still more, <laughs> still more to come and new ones happening. So it can get a, it can a get a bit troublesome. Formula for a series so, and aliens is the same way. Cause I've seen a lot of the aliens movies too. Um, you know, one of the things is an author, some authors choose to have trademark things that happen in certain places, trademark beats. So star Wars usually starts one way and then there's one inciting incident, which is very similar. And then, you know, it rolls on from there and aliens tends to start one way. And then there's one inciting incident. So, it's interesting as an author to decide, do I want to have different beats every time or do I want to stay sort of in this um, almost like a pattern that mm -hmm. changes events? Yeah, I think that's quite, uh, that is an interesting thing. And honestly, I think it works because if they use the same kind of beat structure, you fall into it, you know what it is. It's uh, It feels familiar. It feels like home uh, coming back into the next in a series when they're so close. Um, it's one of the things I like to, to, to say to people too, can get a little worried about. It's like, oh, with, with a structure like this, if I'm planning my story out like this, isn't it just going to be like every other story ever told? You know, people are just going to be bored because it's all the same series of events. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, it's the same kind of structure, but it's not, it's not the same series of events. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on in your story should be original. Uh, right. It's what's actually happening inside of it. The characters and what right. they're doing is completely different. Uh, yeah. And the reactions to the protagonists, you know, uh, Star Wars has a very different antagonist to A Few Good Men. You yeah. know, they're, they're not the same stories. But uh, structurally, yeah, tear them all down. They'll have the same foundations that you can track. Mm -hmm. uh, Moshi's question, what do you have to say to notable writers like Borges, Calvino, Gerald Murnian, uh, who never used plot, dialogue, etc. in their works? Um, I think in terms of, um, well, yeah, since we're talking about plot structure, we're kind of focused on plot. But a lot of writers, uh, especially in literary spaces, can do things like this. They'll do experiments, um, mm -hmm. mostly because at that point, you know, they fully understand structure and how they can play with it or not have it, um, and also understand readership <laughs> who will appreciate that kind of thing so uh, i think if, if you can get away with never using a, a bit of dialogue and the story works absolutely fine um if the plot is exceptionally loose um often you'll find um stuff like that where the plot is really hard to grasp and and there's seemingly disconnected events as dream logic or nightmare logic um can work if it's a tone piece if you're trying to build a tone just make people feel something rather than follow a plot again that can be really tough to sell um because most people who are reading or watching movies and things like that they're, they're looking for a storytelling experience they're looking mm -hmm. to be told a story which is following a structure like this um but if you want it to be all disconnected and weird and all that and people like that hey why not yeah stream of consciousness has its own genre its own readers its own agents it comes down to again what Garrett said earlier about rules being more guidelines. And if you're a new author and your goal is to pitch and be traditionally published to know what is acceptable in your market, regardless of what might be original, because that, you know, is going to affect how marketable you are in the end. You know, if genre fiction has specific plot points that have to happen at certain areas and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to do a stream of consciousness and not do chapters or anything, then you may have trouble pitching it. <laughs> But, you know, there still could be an audience out there for you. Um, it really depends on your writing. It's a creative experience, right? Yeah, it's like do what, what makes you happy and, and people appreciate. Um, for example, I mean, one of the things, uh, this is it's still talking movies on this side of the storytelling, but uh, something that uh, I saw at the weekend streaming as part of the Fright Fest Festival was Hotel Poseidon, um, which essentially had no plot. Uh, 
it was the the main character. It's a very loose plot structure on the outside of it, um, as a character inherits this old hotel. But as he's going through and kind of meeting the oddball inhabitants, um, that experience was all about tone. Uh, and again, uh, nothing. There's nothing really paying off there. It doesn't feel like it has an ending. It's just exploring different things along the way. Um, but certainly falls out of what you would call a standard structure or a standard narrative arc. Um, that kind of thing. It can absolutely work. Um, just if you, you know, you're playing with the form. There's a great question here about um, how does the main character being an anti-hero or anti-villain affect the story structure if it does at all? The structure is part of how your plot moves along. Um, this is sort of a two-sided answer to me anyway. And Gareth, I'd love to hear your thoughts. But ultimately, which character you choose to follow in your story and their growth, whether that's an anti-hero like Riddick um, or, you know, an anti-villain. I'm guessing an anti-villain, wouldn't that mostly be like Megamind? I don't know. Um, but um, they would still have when you strip the story down, you would still usually have a plot with a similar structure to what we're going through, regardless of the character. Yes, agreed, you will. Um, the next point might actually illustrate that. Um, well, okay, not so much. It's going to come up a little in the next one. But if you see mentions of this, uh, I like to mark out obstacle encountered as a large obstacle encountered. So in this case, it's going to be a plot point. Mm -hmm. um something a big obstacle related to the plot now throughout the story as we're going scene by scene chapter by chapter the characters will always be dealing with something there's always a conflict of some kind but when you have major obstacles that they're going to have to climb over those are going to be more tightly related to the actual plot or the quest towards mm -hmm. the finish they're related to resolving matters and those are also your most important parts to start showing elements of the character um, and if they're an anti-hero, we're starting to see them do anti-hero things yeah. <laughs> at this point because they come up against something. They're like, okay, I have to be, I have to be me here to overcome this because again, you're telling a story about somebody who could not be anyone else within this story. So, being them, uh, I think Riddick is just such a a wonderful example uh, of an anti-hero. Probably one of my favorite anti-heroes of all time of any creation ever. <laughs> Um, is Riddick, especially if you just go back to the first movie, Pitch Black, uh, and watch that. Never, there's, I don't think there's been a finer anti-hero ever committed to the screen than, than Riddick. Um, and that's the point, because you, you see him do things, you see him wisecracking when someone else has died, um, because he's just kind of like, well, I survived. And uh, as the story goes on, he, he you know, has to reckon with that and, and become a bit more like, well, I suppose that he would probably think a bit more of a softy when it comes to dealing with everybody else and not be so hard-headed um, to make sure that only he survives. So no, the structure won't change. Um, you just find these beats, these these points where you're actually reinforcing who the characters are, and we go, okay, we're dealing with a, we're dealing with an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. I think uh, very similarly, uh, George Clooney's character in From Dusk Till Dawn um, mm -hmm. is a fantastic. Uh, can't remember which one he is, Gordon Gecko. Um, and uh, it's Gordon and Seth, I believe. Uh, another fantastic example of a, an anti-hero who starts tough and rough, starts to soften up a bit, and by the end is still an anti-hero. I won't yeah. say the final line um, live on our stream, but it's a fantastic final line for an anti-hero to have. Um, he's, he's still that way, but a bit more likable. Mm -hmm. And after our main obstacle here, I'm going to guess what's coming next. More obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to put obstacles in like this um, just to reinforce the fact that you always need something to be happening. They're always dealing with conflict, uh, major or minor. Um, and obstacles, as I said, tend to be the bigger, the bigger things that are standing in the way. Uh, note here is obstacle encountered escalation. Things get worse. Um, yeah. The problems that they're dealing with, the obstacles that they have to overcome are tougher. Um, and usually when I say tougher as well, I mean the the pushback for failure is more severe. So it, the reason that it's not, it's not just harder to do, but it matters more to succeed. Yeah. And you can keep it in mind here too. These points, because they're plot points, we're learning something about the character. You might want to make them fail. In fact, in some cases, you will want to make them fail. You don't want them going through the whole story succeeding in everything uh, all the time. Right. But when they do fail, again, you use that as a point to express information about your villain and about your main characters. 
Um, how do they deal with that failure? Uh, what does the villain do when they win in that moment? You know, do they really push it? Or are they just kind of like meh, 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 down in the background and don't really do much else? Um, yeah. There's lots you can play with there. Again, this is, I guess, emblematic. If you really think about it, you sit down with your story and think about it. While this is like a signpost or a marker of, okay, what's going to happen here? The actual amount of possibilities that you have that surround it are huge. And that's the choices that you make as the author that make your story different. Harry, I just have to share that. I was asked what my protagonist loves most. I said his job. <laughs> Advice from mentor, sack him. Yes. <laughs> Rip it all away. Make him uncomfortable. And we're jumping some barrels there. Progressively getting bigger. Bigger and bigger barrels. And more tired legs. <laughs> It's so true, though, you know, it's it's escalating and you don't want them, like you said, winning too much because then there's almost a. I'm invincible, I can do anything. And all of a sudden you've got maybe a superhero <laughs> theme going, you know, at some point you'd like to see characters trip up just as yeah, a it's, it's relatable. even superheroes can't win all the time. You know, and they don't. I mean, find me a superhero story where they do just win, 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 win. Uh, it can't be the most fun thing to watch uh, or read. Um, yeah, Jeremy is a and bad news and bad knees. Midway through jumping all the barrels, they get a a bite of gout, <laughs> and that just makes it so much worse. So yeah, something like that. Um, you're really just making it bigger and bigger uh, and and badder and badder. And yeah, plot armor. You know, you never want people to suddenly say oh that character's got plot armor uh no they have to suffer and they have to fail on occasion yeah. now um in this order we put the midpoint around here because you're going to have a couple of a couple of big obstacles so we've had a big obstacle that's a big plot point obstacle so we're we learned a lot more about these characters and that was as they as they were first pushed into this realm you know um now that in uh let me bring this all back into context now as well um that could be in Alien, I believe, is going to be the chestburster scene. So that actually comes out. It's the first big obstacle. Everybody freaks out, and we start to learn more about them. Um, and Kane is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, the next obstacle, the second with the escalation, is that they uh, need to go and find the thing. And uh, they're all getting tooled up with flamethrowers and looking for the, looking for the creature. Now, again here... Um, what they know and the reason that escalates quite frankly from that is that they come to understand that they can't harm it if they do mm -hmm. it's going to melt through the hull because it has acid for blood and they're all dead so they mm -hmm. have to find out a different way to do this now when we hit the midpoint of the story well really what happens at the mid there's a lot of choices for you but this will you'll often see this marked as a beat you know an, an actual plot element I like to make sure that whatever happens in this midpoint is something, again, could be an obstacle, something the characters are faced with that they have to overcome, but it reinforces the story's theme while also making the attainment of the ultimate goal absolutely essential. This is mm -hmm. where we come to understand that, yes, you could never have walked away from this, uh, because if you did, uh, you know, we'd make the stakes really, really obvious, and uh, your characters at this point cannot leave. You know, it's... it's, it's uh, completely an obligation to see this through um a lot of people you'll see at the midpoint as well like to throw in a twist if they're working with twists now that does uh sometimes change because i know uh certainly when m night Shyamalan came on the scene the nature of twist placement uh almost changed the game <laughs> with yeah. what he was doing it's like okay now the twist happens at the end <laughs> uh, that's why everybody was blown away by the sixth sense it was just like what now wait what because it wasn't in a place where you normally expect that betrayal uh, mm -hmm. that twist normally happens in the middle so that shakes things up as well so again think of this as a guideline if you want to use a twist it may not necessarily be at the midpoint but certainly use the midpoint to as i said reinforce the theme of what your story is kind of talking about underneath uh, and make sure that we understand there's no way out now they're 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 in this to the end uh but if you want to throw in a twist a little betrayal maybe the betrayal is what locks them in you know that kind of thing you can work with that here um in alien uh this part here really is um the surprise uh i i do consider it a twist as well in the movie that uh, they're not looking for a little cat-sized thing they're looking for something huge and uh the big turnaround there is it starts to murder the crew um 
starts <laughs> killing them off. So they, they can't get out of here. Yeah. And what about you, Catherine? Um, let's see. Going back to the first conflict that they get out of the goblins lair. And the first one is really um, surviving Mirkwood and they find Bjorn and everything. And um, the spiders being captured is the only, he's the only one that can help them because he's the only one that can turn invisible. Um, and that's a point as you said, there needs to be a reason in that conflict that the main character has to be the one that's there and has to be the one that's solving the problem. Um, of course, after they get out of there, it's frying pan into the fire. They're captured by the elves. And that is their high stakes uh, second conflict in the second act. If they don't get out, they will rot in the elven prison. And um, that wouldn't be good for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and story off. Uh, so he actually has to go on his little sneaking thing invisible around the castle again, which reinforces him feeling his need and his spot in the group. Um, steal the keys, literally shove them all in barrels and roll them down the river into the midpoint of the story. Um, so I think one of the things The Hobbit does that's interesting is the twist comes just a little bit after the midpoint, uh, which I did want to point out. If your twist doesn't come right in the middle, that's okay. Um, but I think as a rule, what we usually see is that twist not coming more than like a third of the way through, unless you have mm. a mystery or something like at the very end. To yeah, Garrett's I think, again, there's something there in terms of genre expectations as well to, to really think about. Um, yeah. And for example, you know, like I said, M. Night Shyamalan um, with The Sixth Sense hitting us right there just around the, I guess, maybe turn to the third act. Mm -hmm. um, the likes of the original Saw movie as well, the big old spectacular twist is literally the ending yeah. right at the finish. Um, a few questions here. Uh, Jessica, how many obstacles do you recommend the main character being put up against before the midpoint? Is there a magic number we should be shooting for? Uh, I don't believe there is. Uh, again, it's going to be entirely dependent on your story and your uh, the context of what it is. And of course, length, <laughs> and how long it is. Uh, I think uh, the, the structure that we're going through here, I tend to kind of like um, two after the um, after they've been pushed through those gates into act two. So you have mm -hmm. an obstacle and then an obstacle after that that, de that escalates. So it's demonstrating escalation. And then we have the midpoint. Um, and since we're on midpoint here and we're hopping forward, uh, you, you might not be too surprised to see what happens after the midpoint as the journey continues. Another obstacle with more escalation. So another one coming <laughs> up. I think in this particular structure, we're looking at three. Um, so two two before the midpoint, one after the midpoint. Um, but you could of course have more. Um, I think those that's probably a good number to, to work with in terms of those big uh, obstacles being core plot points driven mm -hmm. um but remember around them you're going to have constant minor conflicts that are happening that's disagreements between characters just uh, a computer doesn't work you know th this kind of little things that are happening um mm -hmm. but these are the big obstacles so you're always kind of filling in the using a, you know some kind of cavity wall filler so to speak in between those big obstacles with conflict that's a really bad metaphor like conflict paste <laughs> that you're mm -hmm. that you're squirting into the gaps um so once we have this, there's uh, another obstacle here. Um, now, at this point, uh, to clarify that with with Alien, you know they 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 start looking for the thing. Um, they're trying to catch it. Um, one crew member is already dead. Um, they trap it in the vents and try to go after it, and Dallas ends up losing his life. You know, again, is another big obstacle. It does not pay off. Again, uh, a lot of things like Alien, sci-fi horror, failure at every turn. <laughs> the characters are paying for it dearly, uh, which yeah. takes us into the next point: crisis. Now, again, a lot of stories are not necessarily going to have this crisis point. Um, I like to refer to it as the all hope is lost. Um, but you'll hear people call it disaster or crisis or, or any other number of, of things. But it's essentially where your protagonists are so worn down that they ultimately thought after overcoming these obstacles or, or failing to them on occasion that they had the solution in their hands. Um, but they attempt to defeat the antagonist using that solution and it doesn't work. So they... Uh, what else is it referred to? Ah, Dark Night of the Soul, I think, is one mm -hmm. thing that you'll have people refer to it as well, where they're uh, in the pit of despair. You know, they're going to accept defeat. It's not working. Um, 
there's a couple of ways that this happens. Um, I would have disaster that leads to the all hope is lost because there is an action that they take that it works out disastrously and leads them all to doubt. Um, to say alien, you know, for that, um, they then decide that they're going to scuttle the ship and take off, but they need to go get the oxygen canisters while they're all and, and Ripley needs to set the uh, self destruct sequence. That goes wrong. The alien gets in the way and butchers Lambert and Parker, and Ripley is alone. That's it. It doesn't work. And uh, at that point, then, because she can't get off quickly, uh, she has to go back and try to disable the self destruct sequence, uh, mm -hmm. which again doesn't work. So the, the tension, the suspense is all, everything is going wrong. Um, and that story is just her struggling through it all um, is really, really great. And, uh, you know, a note there if you're ever thinking about doing anything with horror um not just cinematically but if you, if you like alien go back and watch it and listen to the sounds that lambert makes over the radio while the alien is killing her it's, it's some of the most horrific sound effects you've ever heard uh just that scream and trying to that that actually works in uh written prose as well if you work something like that in how, how it actually sounds when somebody is beyond help mm-hmm and what about the hobbit does the hobbit have to work with a, a disaster and uh crisis point yes it does so um you know they get up to the mountain and they've made it all this way and they realize that they think they've missed their one chance to get in the back door and um, a lot of readers i think might think that that is the crisis point but that shifts the focus off the main character the hobbit and on to his companions he actually sort of stays hopeful gets inside it's he sort of has his crisis moment because this has all been a value driven story uh really when he wakes up the dragon who's not dead and the dragon not only chases him out and traps them in this mountain but they know the dragon's about to go destroy the whole village that just helped them and you know his whole value system that's driven him this whole time is returning these dwarves home and doing the right thing by these people that i think is really when you see him at his lowest and feeling like he needs to find a way to get or help and there's nothing he can do yeah well the stakes are quite on there as well <laughs> and i think about um story-wise too one thing i left out in alien that uh, could also add in another obstacle coming in there uh, just after the midpoint thing is uh, the Ash revelation. You know that Ash is a, a company a company droid and is there to uh, make sure that the thing survives over all the crew ex mm -hmm. is expendable, as it says, <laughs> crew expendable. So they have to take care of Ash uh, and learn about that. So there's a twist. There's the big twist in Alien. And once we have crossed our crisis point, of course, the characters rally. They have to. Um, we've made clear at the midpoint. You know, they're propelled in here. There's no option to give up. Of course, they might want to. And that's where the crisis comes in. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything seems to be going wrong and they're, they're losing it. They have to rally. And mm -hmm. uh, we come through to the climax. Of course, your climax is your uh, final showdown. Uh, everything yeah. comes to uh, a head. Um, final confrontation takes place. And it, then it's up to you what happens. Are they yeah. victorious? Maybe not. Maybe you have a big old climax and everybody dies. Um, <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, some of those, yeah, the big heroic tales as well. Heroic sacrifice is a big, big thing here. Uh, your protagonist does not always have to win. Uh, and certainly in that sense, you know, your antagonist doesn't always have to lose. Um, right. They will a lot of the time, maybe they both lose, you know, again, in that heroic sacrifice type thing, they'll, your main characters will sacrifice themselves to take down the villain. Um, so and you sometimes your protagonist is the only survivor, like in Alien, you know, mm -hmm. and they're bringing back not only i mean it's like a bittersweet ending sure your protagonist got out but then ultimately they're bringing back everything else with them yes it's what matters as the story changes mm -hmm. um through the process of the structure or the process of the arc um things have to change along the way quite frankly mm -hmm. now, again the climax of alien going to be the the confrontation inside the uh, escape shuttle and uh ripley manages to defeat the creature so there we have Yay. people punching each other the big fight happens um i see uh, a couple of questions here uh, tim brown should the crisis be a surprise or can you tease it in the introduction um that's up to you uh, to my mind i generally don't like it um teased in the introduction 
Um, it gives a little too much of an idea where things are going. Um, I know that uh, a lot of writers think it's intriguing, like it's an immediate, it's an easy way to get an immediate hook. Um, it's almost like they're, you know, your character is lying in rubble. Uh, and there's fire and they wake up and then the next thing is uh, think of this cinematically is the next shot is like they open their eye they're in the rubble covered in dirt and there's fire around them and everything and then when they open their eyes they're actually waking up in bed at the start of the story yeah i was like okay right so we're gonna get to that point later on where they're lying in the rubble yeah. i kind of don't want to know that it's a bit redundant because i want to get there and i'll see that anyway um but it, you know some people seem to like it i think it's a matter of personal taste it is you know i feel like for me personally when i know that there's a big climax because it was hinted at in the opening it makes the rest of the story read like a prologue instead of a story um but i say that as a speed reader so again it's personal preferences okay i'm gonna get to the end of this book in about five six hours anyway so like I can just wait until I get there. Um, and a lot of readers, they read one book at a time. It depends on your genre too. You know, if you read this one book and you're like, well, thank you for telling what they're going to be at at the end. <laughs> it almost be like you gave me a big spoiler. Um, but it works in some cases. We mentioned Megamind earlier and the whole story opens with, and here's the day I'm falling to my death, you know. Um, and then it plays really well leading up to that point. I think it's about how you do your storytelling and not just hinting at it at the beginning. If you hint at the, at the beginning and then maintain your reader's attention for the story, for what it is throughout, then that could still work. Yeah. Yeah. I guess about right. Uh, I can see, uh, Mike there. Yeah. There's no crisis. What propels a story to the climax? Um, I would say it, it pretty much has to, the crisis mm -hmm. is the push point um what you may not see is the dark night of the soul side of it where the uh failure of the crisis is so devastating um you can also go the way that the crisis is simply the stakes have blown out of the thermometer so mm -hmm. you have to stop this and you have to stop this now uh, otherwise the repercussions will be however the characters are still just uh, they're propelled by this new realization or this new urgency um to bring things to a close but mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the crumbling will yeah. I mean, and for some stories like happy stories, romances that are warm and cozy the whole way through, you know, you might not have a big battle showdown, but that doesn't mean you don't have a climax. The climax could be, you know, her wondering at the last minute, do I really want to marry this guy and pushing through that? You know, it's not always got to be on an epic scale to still be a conflict. That's right. And once we're done with everybody beating each other up and <laughs> whoever's winning uh, at the end, um, you know, it could be emotionally beating each other up, just have to be violent. Uh, the resolution. And of course, the resolution is simply the ending. Uh, everything, well, no, not entirely the ending, but we're showing here how things have changed in the, you know, the wake of that climactic confrontation. Um, mm -hmm. This is where we have to, in a short time, because now we're into Act 3, we're closing off. This is sh much shorter than everything else we've been through. Uh, but after all that your characters have been through, you know, the world looks different, as I said in the beginning. They're not the same people, or the, the landscape is not the same as it was before. Um, you could make it literally, you know, as I said, you've blown up half the world or something, so the place is literally different, and now the, the landscape has physically changed. Um, or simply through their eyes. You know, their, their mindset has changed from what it was in the beginning. Life, life just won't be the same for them uh, now right. that they've come to understand different things through what they've, uh, through what they've discovered. Um, of course, this resolution at the end, uh, if I were to talk about Alien, is uh, Ripley signing off in the thing. It's, it's, uh, the, there's a quick reflection and the sadness in that recording of acknowledging the loss. Everything mm -hmm. they've been through, she lost her crew, um, lost essentially her job now, and also understands that the company was going to kill them all for the sake of this thing. So we understand now that her entire worldview has changed. You know, Nothing will ever be the same after this. Yeah. Daryl, how long should the resolution be? So, you know, I think comparing Alien and The Hobbit are really good here because Alien's resolution may feel quicker than The Hobbit's because The Hobbit, the resolution is he wakes up, the, art, the battle's over, and then it's acknowledging how much has changed as he travels back home over the course of a chapter. Uh, but not all resolutions have to take a whole chapter. It's going to be up to where you are in your story wrapping up all the loose ends that you've 
let fray out through the story, just making sure that the reader knows what has changed about the character and why the story made their world or them different. And very closely tied to the resolution, you know, as we, we see the new world, we understand it's all changed. We have our, our very final little denouement. And this is just signing off, more or less, mm-hmm. uh, very, very quickly. Like Catherine said, something like this um, can be wrapped up. Denouement and resolution can be almost, you know, they're pretty much tied at the hip. Uh, so it can be very fast, very fast indeed. Uh, or mm-hmm. you can slow it down and, and more closely, mm-hmm. you know, uh, focus on differences between them. So, for example, your resolution uh, focuses on explaining or showing um how things have changed uh what i like to have in the denouement uh, to separate them is that it brings everything to a close with a a reinforcement of the theme once again Mm -hmm. so all your uh loose loose ends are tied up in the resolution i can see uh thank you for the the brain jog there dory on the (laughs) on the description tying up loose ends um in your resolution and your denouement is a final sign off that again harkens to what this story has actually been talking about um in terms of subtext a reflection that means something is uh, just a meaningful way to sign us off. And again, very quickly, it doesn't need three chapters of, <laughs> of uh, your waxing poetic about the, the nature of grief. Um, it's very quickly just makes us think about it, that something has been said. Mm-hmm. And right. I like uh, Chase, yeah, opposite of the opening image. So it's a nice uh, kind of artistic way to go. And a false resolution as a twist, Mike, uh, but more in series than at the end of a standalone because in a series you know there's going to be a second book if you leave a standalone book with just a false resolution that doesn't get resolved then it's sort of almost like well why did i (laughs) i read all this time and i'm never going to figure it out you know yeah i almost uh whenever i do see those I, i i rarely tend to see them as a twist they're just like a little parting um wink (laughs) <laughs> artistically i don't think anybody really takes them as as twists it's mm-hmm. the likes of uh everybody thought they've won um we've defeated the villain and then your final scene or your final little chapter is just a very short one of a character you know uh walks into a bazaar and buys something at a a, a trader and then we see their face somebody says like you know where are you from traveler and they say something and we recognize it's the villain they didn't die um mm-hmm. that's just a parting wink it's not really a false resolution i never t- i never, never kind of see that as a twist but uh they're nice to have those i like those because you get to the end and you know you're like oh they're not done they're going to be back uh when's when's the next more. one <laughs> <laughs> if there's not more that's not nice <laughs> <laughs> or you have to wait like 12 years for the next one also yeah. not nice <laughs> well that brings us to the end of the structure um i, I hope this has been useful in terms of uh, kind of illustrations and thinking about it in your own stories or things you're thinking about as we went, uh, like I said, you know, it's uh, it's very much a foundational bunch of pillars to to build around, and it is what's built around it that matters. Um, people will fall into a structure like this much more easily, and we did have some talk about more literary stuff and playing with form and uh, and really breaking the rules at that point. But uh, I think this kind of stuff you really got to understand before you move on to tearing things down and, and still keeping people interested in it. Um, any final comments, Catherine? I think this has been great. Um, and the questions have been great. And again, I, these are what I refer to as bones of stories. It's what you build your story around. Um, as Gareth said earlier, you can strip most stories down and they're going to come down to these bare bones. Um, But if you went through and you're worried because you don't have all these bones or you don't know where they fall, that might be where you look for some developmental editing help. And we're happy to help you with that too. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. I think that's, that's very important. It's often if you are, you know, you have written something or you're reading it and you're not quite sure something just feels wrong. Uh, Mm -hmm. Go back to the structure, because quite frankly, it's probably just something structural in terms of order or or, or this next thing. You know, even thinking back to the obstacles, the obstacle and then the escalating obstacle, maybe they didn't escalate. Uh, It could be something as simple as that. That's why it feels flat. 
Or um, it in the wrong place. You've got all your yeah. obstacles at the end and nothing in the beginning, and therefore you're beginning slow, or all at the beginning and then at the end, and therefore your ending is slow. Indeed. And don't be afraid to follow the structure, you know, for those reasons. Um, like I said, you get a lot of people who think like, oh, I'm not following a structure. That's putting myself in a box and all of that. As, as I know, the, the, the content, the, what you bring to it in between uh, is really what matters. Uh, I think <laughs> I used this in a class. Uh, it may have been last night where, uh, you know, you, do, you don't go out and buy the John Wick box set expecting John Wick to die in movie one. Right. You know that it's the John Wick trilogy. He's going to be around for the stretch. And but the film is thrilling. It's magnificent. It's an action extravaganza, highly entertaining. Uh, people love it. Uh, but it's not surprising. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's what's in there. The structure is what it is. Um, well, it is surprising because different things happen in between. But they're not going to... Going in, you already know kind of what you're in for to a certain degree. Um, right. There's no need to throw structure out the window because you think it'll somehow make things more spontaneous. You know, yeah, be spontaneous around it. Okay, I think that uh, sums it all up. Thank you all for coming, and thank you all for the thank yous in the comments, too. Uh, we'll see you next week, I believe. Um, next week, we'll have uh, Daniel back in, and we're going to go through some more stories in terms of structure, so we'll break down a few and, and see where they fall on different points, and uh, see how that's going. Um, one thing that I should mention, too, since we're on here today, is uh, very soon we have NaNoWriMo coming up. Um it's September at the minute, but November will be on us before you know it. Uh, we are sponsoring NaNoWriMo, and as part of that sponsorship, we also have a story structure worksheet um, that I will see if I can get a copy of for everybody. It goes through each of these things as you're planning um, and gives you uh, just a few columns to mark out in that structure. Again, like if, if you feel like you've gotten lost, if things are a bit flat because it's not escalating properly, this gives you a sheet to note down what happens in this scene, what is the conflict that's at play and can really you know keep you on on track even if you don't like planning all that much i think i uh you, <laughs> many people here will know my thoughts on planning i don't recommend planning fully all the time uh, which is why this sheet is uh, a bit loose with that you know it's not uh, it's not 100 so i'll see if i can get a copy of that for everybody uh certainly um for members uh we'll have it in mighty networks as soon as possible so you can grab it from there yeah just in time for preptober Indeed. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming. We will sign off and uh, see you next week, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.